Chapter 3 The roar of a big motor jolted Ben out of a deep sleep. He sat bolt upright, rubbing eyes that seemed cemented shut. This wasn't his bed. Where was he? The engine noise was so intense that he felt a churning in his stomach. What makes a sound like that? A garbage truck? A semi? Or maybe... He managed to focus enough to take in the sight of the dilapidated parlor around him. A crane carrying a giant wrecking ball. Griffin! A shape stirred inside Griffin's sleeping bag. Ben tore open the zipper to reveal his slumbering friend. Griffin, wake up! What? It's morning! They're tearing down the building! Griffin popped up like a champagne cork. Let's get out of here, he cried. The two scrambled for the window. The entire house was vibrating with the clamorous thrum of a crane. Griffin got there first and stuffed two sleeping bags and then Ben through the missing planks. He was halfway out himself, his stomach over the sill, when he realized he couldn't move forward or backward. I'm stuck, he hissed. Ben grabbed him by the wrist and hauled him with all his might, but Griffin remained hung in the opening. A tremendous crash shook the structure and the very earth beneath Ben's feet. The impact pitched Griffin out of the window, sending him sprawling on top of Ben. The two scrambled up, dazed. Griffin was white with plaster dust from the waist down. Run, he bellowed. They fled, the sleeping bags trailing behind them. As they rounded the corner, a chilling sight met their eyes. The titanic wrecking ball buried deep in the shattered front of the old Rockford house. If they needed any more reason to get away from there, it came from the horrified job foreman. Hey, you, this is an active demolition zone. Coach Nimnitz would have been amazed by the speed and stamina of their escape, which were much greater than they ever showed in gym class. The two kept up a long searing sprint for several minutes, spurred on by a series of loud booms behind them. They were halfway across town before Griffin pronounced the coast clear enough to slow down to a walk. The next time you get a brilliant idea, like spending the night in a death trap, Ben panted. Pretend my number is unlisted. In the distance, there was a long, low rumble followed by an earth-shaking thump. That was almost us, you know. My mother didn't raise me to be rubble. No risk, no reward, said Griffin, catching his breath. Some reward? We got revenge on the town for our skate park? Only nobody knows about it but us. Griffin pulled the Babe Ruth card out of his pocket and waved it under his friend's nose. Read it and weep. He gave Ben a quick recap of the discovery in the secret drawer. Babe Ruth? Wow, do you think it's real? Griffin shrugged. It makes sense. Old house, old card. The question is, what's it worth? But Griffin, it's not yours, Ben whispered. Griffin indicated the plume of dust that swirled in the air several blocks behind them. When you knock down a house, you're really just throwing it in the garbage. It's not stealing to take something out of the garbage, is it? Besides, he regarded the card ruefully. The sandwich of champions? It's probably not valuable. I never get that lucky. But how can you know for sure, asked Ben. There are experts in this kind of thing. Ben's eyes widen. Palomino's Emporium? Griffin smiled bravely. We'll get an appraisal. Palomino's Emporium of Collectibles and Memorabilia was a fortress unto itself. It was located just past the main strip of town in a low building surrounded by a high chain link fence that always made Griffin think of a prisoner of war camp. It had once been a stonecutter's workshop. As young children, he and Ben had always been fascinated by the display of grave markers in the courtyard. Now the headstones had been replaced by sickly grass and a large dog, who was, thankfully, asleep. Griffin indicated the front door. Vintage items bought and sold. Best prices guaranteed. S. Wendell Palomino, owner and proprietor. Although they lived less than a mile away, this was their first time inside the store. Kids almost never came here. It was more like a museum than a comic shop. A museum where you could look but not touch, and everything was under surveillance by grim-faced guards. There were no rows of shelves cluttered with books, toys, knickknacks, cards, and souvenirs. In Palomino's Emporium, 
everything was frozen into its own glass case with harsh lighting and security wiring. The whole place felt about as welcoming and as warm as a bank vault. Ben leaned into one of the displays to see an action figure and gaped at the sticker. 640 bucks? Are they crazy? A tall, cadaverous man with a ring of white hair and a bald crown walked over to him. That's because it's genuine 1966 Mr. Spock doll from the classic Star Trek TV series, still in its original packaging. Ben frowned. What kid has $600 to spend on a toy? Exactly, the man agreed. This isn't a toy store. Real collectibles aren't for kids. They're a serious investment. Are you Mr. Palomino? Griffin asked him. I'm Tom Duferin, the assistant manager. He stretched out a bony arm and indicated another man who was behind a long counter, inserting comic books into precisely sized protective sleeves. That's the big boss over there. S. Wendell Palomino was short, stocky, and surprisingly young in his mid-thirties. Griffin guessed, not nearly as ancient as Tom Dufferin. His curly hair almost, but not quite, fit under a New York Rangers cap. Thick glasses made his eyes appear twice their size, like two eggs sunny side up. He turned those eggs on his sixth grade visitors. What can I do for you, young gentleman? Griffin pulled out his Babe Ruth card. I'm thinking of selling this, and I hear you guarantee the best prices. The owner extended a pudgy hand and accepted the last surviving piece of the Rockford estate. His bushy eyebrows shot straight up to the Rangers logo on his hat. Griffin was immediately alert. It's valuable, he asked. Palomino laughed shortly. Well, it would be, if it was real. You see, a lot of the old card series were reissued in the 60s and 70s. This one, the Top Dog Bakery line, was knocked off in 1967. I've seen a couple of these, but not in a long time. Excellent quality reproduction. He held the card under a large magnifying glass attached to the counter. You see this solid blue border? This was striped in the original. They weren't allowed to make an exact replica because that would have violated counterfeiting laws. That's how we know it's a copy. Ben took in the crestfallen look on Griffin's face. 1967 was a long time ago, he said hopefully. So it's still a little bit valuable, right? Absolutely, the collectibles dealer confirmed. Why, I saw a whole set of these once go for $1,500. But a single card like this? Well, I'm a sucker for the Bambino. I'll give you 100 bucks for it. Griffin sighed, his visions of solving the family's money woes popping, popping like soap bubbles. Still, he was a born negotiator. 150, he said instantly. Palomino chuckled. You drive a hard bargain, sonny boy. Tell you what, 120. Sold. The dealer counted out six crisp $20 bills from a thick roll and accepted the card in return. The boys peered over the counter as he stooped to turn the dial of a portable safe on the floor at his feet. He opened the door and locked his new acquisition inside. Griffin frowned. If the card isn't valuable, how come you need to keep it in a safe? This isn't Toys R Us, sonny boy, lectured Palomino, out of breath from the simple act of straightening up. We take security seriously at Palomino's Emporium. A baseball card is the easiest thing in the world to swipe. Stick it in your pocket and nobody even knows it's there. It stays in the lockbox until it's cataloged and ready for the display cases. Can't somebody just steal the whole safe? Ben put in. The dealer snorted. You kids kill me. Steal the safe. That's funny. Griffin spoke up for his friend. He means it's not very big and there's a handle on top. You could pick it up and walk out the door. Palomino, Palomino beckoned the two boys behind the counter. All right, you guys, give it a try. Griffin and Ben took firm hold of the handle and pulled. The lockbox didn't budge. Come on, the dealer was grinning at them. Put some muscle into it. Grunting with effort, they pulled with all their might. Nothing. Palomino burst out laughing in their faces. It's bolted to the floor. Embarrassed, Griffin and Ben shrunk out from the behind the counter and headed for the door. 
Tom Dufferin offered a sympathetic smile as they passed by. You are not the first one to try it. I doubt you'll be the last. Pleasure doing business with you, young gentlemen, Palomino called after them. Come back any time. As they passed the sleeping dog and stepped outside the fence, both, both boys relaxed visibly. There was something unnerving about Palomino's emporium, almost as if the store had its own energy field. Ben took a breath of fresh air. Sorry you're not rich. In answer, Griffin took out his money, peeled off three of the twenties, and handed them to Ben. You're cut, he said. I didn't do anything, Ben protested. Sure you did. You stuck with the plan when everybody else bailed. That's how it was with Griffin. Always the plan, even when the plan had nearly gotten them buried under a building.